Welcome to Galaxy Brains. An infinite amount of cash, cash. I'm your host, Alex Thorne. The U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. Bitcoin made a new all-time high. If you're not long, if you're not long, you're short. Satoshi's going to come on there, laugh hysterically, go quiet. All Bitcoin's going to be erased. Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the best crypto asset. Bitcoin is going to zero. Welcome back to Galaxy Brains. As always, I'm your host, Alex Thorne, head of firmwide research at Galaxy. And we have a great episode for you this week. Coy Garrison, partner at Steptoe, former counsel for SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, is our guest. And we're going to talk with Coy at length about what it would actually mean tangibly on the ground if the SEC were to materially change its posture on digital assets. When might that happen in the case, in, a, in a bullish case, particularly depending on the outcome of the U.S. presidential election? What it would mean, uh, what the SEC would do immediately to offer relief uh, to various parties, but also what the timeline and structure of sort of a longer term framework might look like. It's a fascinating conversation with Koi. Of course, we'll check with our good friend Bimnet Abibi uh, from Galaxy Trading to talk about markets and, and Bitcoin. I mean, 72 uh, 73K uh, this week, so it's been uh, pretty exciting. Before we get to that, I need to remind you to please refer to the link to the disclaimer in the podcast notes and note that none of the information in this podcast constitutes investment advice or an offer recommendation or solicitation by Galaxy or any of its affiliates to buy or sell any securities. Let's hop right into it. Let's go now to our friend Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Trading. As always, Bimnet, welcome to Galaxy Brains. Thanks for having me. Uh, wow, exciting time. Uh, I don't know if uh, we have the wide shot. People can see the block clock here. Uh, we hit 73,635 on Tuesday. My count of the intraday all-time high uh, from March 2024 was 73,835. So we were just about a little bit less than $200 off of the all-time high for Bitcoin this week, a week before the election. Uh, I don't know. what was What's your take on that? Yeah, I think Bitcoin at this point is the $1.4 trillion gorilla in the room you can't ignore, yeah. right? It is absolutely massive. It is accelerating higher. Um, it's one of those things that, like, if you're an institutional investor, you're looking at it being like, okay, what are the arguments for why Bitcoin can go higher? There's the whole monetary debasement thing, right, which we can get into. But you look at trades that benefit from that, and you immediately think about gold, which has gone on a spectacular run this year. Yeah. Uh, on a risk-adjusted basis, one of the best trades you know you could have done. It's super liquid. Um, it's up, you know, called thirty to forty percent on the year, making fresh all-time highs every other day. So that part of the argument is is going great, mm -hmm. right? And then you think about it from the regulatory and the adoption side of things. Well, the ETF is incredibly popular. Incredibly. Right. The futures product are incredibly popular. The regulatory landscape is probably only going to improve regardless of what candidate mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is happening. Uh, and then you look at kind of the other broader kind of macro risk things. You know, S&P at all time highs, essentially same thing with, with, with NASDAQ, a Fed that's easing, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, it's really, really hard for folks to ignore this. This thing is traded almost in every country in the world. Yeah. Right? There are local exchanges. There's a bunch of countries mining it. Mining it. I mean, it, it, it is yeah. unstoppable. It's just a matter of when, not not if, you, you break through all-time highs. And then the question is, what type of FOMO do, do folks get once it breaks? I will tell you, I'm one of those folks that looked at the gold chart, looked at the silver chart, and saw it break, have this clean technical break. And, you know, if you chose not to follow particularly on the on the gold example you you missed out on a, on a ton of gains yeah right and so you know when bitcoin breaks this you know, 74k level mm -hmm. um i do think it, it it's going to accelerate and it's going to force people to to pay attention um and it, it's really i mean just think about it. It, it there's the etfs are insanely we're bitcoin's trading like 40 billion dollars a day it's super liquid there's yeah. a whole ecosystem around it right you can Buy it on on futures and and do do you margin buy it in financing. Buy in your fintech apps and yeah. your retail exchanges. You can buy it at fidelity.com. Absolutely. And the other thing I think people are, are really discounting, which has I think like gone through a transformational change over the past six months or so, is kind of the financing behind crypto, right? Since the ETFs have have launched, you know, Bitcoin has traded more like a, a general collateral asset, basically an asset you can fund at very low costs. 
And so folks have been able to get like real liquidity from their Bitcoin without actually selling it. Right. And so when you get liquidity into a market and you're able to finance it, that reduces, you know, sell pressure and that actually makes people want to own it more right. because they're like, oh, they can I can buy it. it on margin. Yeah. Right. And and it becomes almost like a cash equivalent, but you don't actually have to spend the Bitcoin yeah. to spend cash. And so it there's so many positive things happening for it. And you're looking at it being like it just got to, you know, one point four, one point five trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the naysayers will be like, it's got no no use case, blah, blah, blah. But all it's done is just defy all the critics yeah. constantly. And now there's just so much momentum behind it that, you know, I think, like, it's really hard for a, a macro investor or an asset allocator to, to ignore this, right? Yeah. Gold's at $19 trillion, but it's got a bunch of central banks, you know, printing money and buying it. Mm -hmm. And also has well, thousands of years of, of being money. And yet Bitcoin's kind of catching up in, yeah. in a way, although on relative and, basis. And one thing that I think about with gold, too, is just another sort of like you're just sort of talking through some of the, the positives and negatives. Just, you know, it can, it's held in a centralized manner. Gold is not decentralized. Sure. Yeah. I've got absolutely. a little bit of gold on my finger. There's plenty of like gold out there, but the vast majority of it is like underneath the New York Fed or like in a couple depositories. It's not capable of being taken uh delivery of at scale, right? So it's it's, it's not, not and, decentralized. And fractions of it as yeah. well. And there's a couple been, coins here and there. Yeah, is and there good, have been but examples like, of of like governments confiscating gold oh, yeah. over time and oh, forcing yeah. you to redeem it. You know levels that aren't fair, right? Et right, 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 right. Um, so yeah, I mean the the. the but like you that's know, you don't have to preach to me it, about the benefits. I know it's, that yeah, it's one thing that has always strikes me though because like the argument for owning gold is is usually quite similar to what the bitcoiners say about owning bitcoin, protection against inflation or debasement or from seizure. I mean yeah, if you have American Eagle coins in your house, sure they're probably not going to be able to seize those very easily. Yeah. But the vast majority of people who buy into that trade like gold through a brokerage and don't actually have the gold. Yeah. To me, that's extremely like con uh, contradictory and like uh, to own like a government collapse hedge, but not actually store it yourself. Yeah. And the thing is, is you really can't store it yourself in size gold. It's physically too large and heavy. Um, super interesting. I want to ask you too about um, like corporate adoption, right? There's a yeah. There's the, the headlines Microsoft about Microsoft. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I guess now I guess a, an activist, small activist investor, did whatever is required to get a question added for shareholders to some upcoming Microsoft board meeting about whether Microsoft should put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. And Microsoft wrote back uh, recommending that they yeah well they they're recommending the the shareholders vote against it, the board, but also they wrote back saying like, look, we look at everything, including crypto for our balance sheet allocation. But do you, regardless of, I don't want to speculate given that that's a single name stock, but like, do we see this happening more, whether from activists or otherwise? Like, I mean, because like you said, it's really quite difficult to ignore. We're not saying like, hey, you should put on, you know, doggy poggy coin. Like this is, you know, the state of, state in, of Wisconsin investment board bought it. We just saw a report Emory that Emory University, University has, has bought the Bitcoin ETFs. Like this is a, not a niche asset yeah do you, th you think you're gonna see more corporates like have to either be forced to by their shareholders or decide to i mean it's uh it's it's a tough one like i i, I don't fully you know on know the nuances behind getting a you know one of the world's largest companies to hold it on their balance sheet uh but i do know that blackrock is a large holder of a <laughs> of, of everything, yeah, of uh, everything in yeah. the U.S. Yeah, uh, you know, State Street, uh, Fidelity. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, big most, shareholders that uh, own uh, Microsoft that yeah. like Bitcoin. Yeah, besides like Vanguard and Schwab, like most of these companies are at least like pretty friendly to, to crypto. But and is so the case if you're like um, managing a corporate balance sheet with a bunch of assets on it, like? cash and whatever else yeah like most of them are right because that's where they they get the money to buy back their stocks right i mean there's just so much cash and all these big companies balance sheets like is the case not the same the 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 case to own bitcoin as it would be for theoretically an individual or for an endowment like it's the risk return well, profile I mean, like, well, like it's, how, just, it's too there... volatile i mean think about like but i mean couldn't don't you just do a small percentage well, you can i mean yeah, i don't see why you shouldn't Right, I mean, like theoretically, the yeah. case, the, the the math on like on sharp how to improve yeah, the portfolio, if, it's the same, it's right? The same. No, yeah. I mean, put simply, allocating a small percentage of your portfolio into Bitcoin yeah. has proven to enhance your returns from a outright 
actual absolute return perspective and also from a reducing volatility yeah. perspective. And so every portfolio that has added Bitcoin to a small degree has benefited in a, an improved sharp yeah. on that portfolio Historically versus having speaking, not right. do, doing right. so. And that argument with Bitcoin at all time highs essentially holds truer than ever. Yeah. It's funny like when people um, – there's institutional surveys all the time. I know Fidelity has done this survey many times of what is the reason why if you're not doing – investing in Bitcoin, what's the reason why? And always volatility is the number one answer. And it's funny because I look at that and I think what people really mean is they don't like the downward volatility. Yeah. Right? Because yeah, like no, the reality is like, I mean, Bitcoin has, yeah, it's had many 50% drawdowns or, and a few like 80 plus percent drawdowns, but it's also just been up forever over yeah. a long enough time frame. So it's kind of like, well, they want the volatility to the upside. They just don't want the downside volatility. But like, you know, it's sort of if you don't like me on my uh, bad days, you don't deserve me on my good days. Because yeah. this is an asset that like continuously comes back. You've got like the world's biggest economists always talking smack about it and then just always made to look a fool over and over again. Um, you kind of just have to hold through that. I mean, think about like even Michael Saylor, right? Like, remember when we were talking a couple years ago about like people were worried, like, oh man, like what's his like liquidation level? Well, I can tell you with certainty, it's nowhere near this price. <laughs> like he ended up being super right about the price of Bitcoin. So I, it just seems like, you know, how many times are they going to, our corporate board's going to say no? And how many times are they going to be made a fool of? two, three years in the future. Like, at some point, no, they've got to learn. Point, yeah. No, absolutely. I, I just think it happens over time. You know, the younger generations, you know, as they elevate themselves across, the, you know, various companies and stuff. I can't tell you how many different, like, conferences or, you know, happy hours, et cetera, where it's like, oh, like, yeah, we're really into Bitcoin, the younger, more junior staff versus, like, the senior yeah. PM that's, like, a little bit more conservative. Makes sense. And so I think just as adoption happens and as, as time passes you know you'll see folks get more comfortable yeah well we're i guess we just keep watching uh luckily we, we it, I, feel, I just feel like a broken record you know sometimes it's like no I, you know it's like I, have to, I i i don't want to apologize for having to constantly tell people that bitcoin even if you look at the google trend numbers like it's not it's not back like the google searches people aren't searching that comes in after the a clean all-time high break you think we start to get some some gappage. No, right? I mean, I, I think there's a lot of folks that have been thinking about allocating this year that that haven't allocated, and it's all of those people in the middle. And you know, even the folks that are allocated, they're like, I don't own enough. Yeah. Right. Uh, and you know, you just kind of think about all the, all the positive headwinds. It's like, like, take the example that that Trump wins, right? Howard Lutnick, right, who is spearheading the transition team. Yeah. The transition team was on a podcast the other day saying that he owns hundreds of millions of dollars of Bitcoin yeah. and that he expects it to be billions. Yeah. Right? That's the guy leading the transition team for <laughs> yeah. the, the odds-on favorite. I mean, to top, top other people too. Vivek is huge, loves Bitcoin. Uh, RFK Jr. loves Bitcoin. Don Jr., uh, the former oh. president's son, loves JD Bitcoin. Vance owns JD Vance some owns Bitcoin. Bitcoin. It's, it's, right? a, it, it's, it's really hard for me to be like, the regulatory environment's not going to be good. Yeah. Right, at the very least. Right. Uh, and, you know, you have things like the options that are going to launch on, on, on Bitcoin. At some point, yeah, ETFs. for the ETFs, yeah. Uh, and so... Doesn't that, like, dramatically enhance liquidity, right? It gives, like, people ways to bet in so many different ways. It and, gives way, folks a way to hedge, yeah. to earn yield on their stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, 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 it definitely enhances liquidity. Last episode before the election... Uh, which is next week. Mm -hmm. um, good Lord. I th I'm happy it's, we're going to, you know, no matter what happens, like, I'm just going to be so happy when election season is over. It, it's so long in this country. You know, there are countries where they cap, like, campaigning if, like for only, like, 45 days or something. Like, yeah. Because it's just like, dude, I mean, like, it's way too long. It is right? way too long. <laughs> and, and way too polarized. Oh, I yeah. I feel like, you know, people just need to sit down and, I know. you know, have a meal with each other. And, I agree. And not be so... Left it's, or right. Um, yeah. But yeah, in terms of the election and, and how to trade it, the one thing I know for sure is that the market is constantly surprised by election outcomes and even more surprised by price action Yeah. Um, subsequently. And, you know, the best example that I've heard, and I may have said it on the last podcast, but if you knew the results in 2016, 
right? Uh, you, you a day in advance, you probably would have traded it really poorly. <laughs> yeah, it's weird, right? Uh-huh. Like, and so so what? Like the Trump outcome trades didn't actually pan out. Well, the Trump outcome trades were expected to be stocks down. Right. Right? And stocks ripped. (laughs) They went from limit down to, you know, flying higher. Wow. Uh, And so it's it's really, uh, you know, I think it's one of those things where you're probably meant to be uh, a fast follow rather than a... On whichever it is. Yes. Wait and see where the trend is. And once you kind of get an inkling... Yeah. Then you kind of go with the, then, yeah, with, with the trend. Uh, but it should be exciting. I'm hoping for a very clear election outcome. Yep. That is the Me one too. thing. I agree. I would I like am. it to be clear. Yes. Let's hope we don't have like four or five days uh, of uncertainty. Ambiguity. Ugh, that'd be awful. Well, we're going to know soon. Uh, that's it for this uh, for this week, though. Bim, uh, Bim Nadabibi from Galaxy Trading. As always, thanks. Appreciate it. Let's go now to our guest, Coy Garrison, partner at Steptoe, former counsel to SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, who herself has been on Galaxy Brains. Coy, welcome to Galaxy Brains. Hey, Alex. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to have you on here because we're a week out from the U.S. presidential election, and our audience and the crypto markets in general are very focused on the outcome of this election uh, because it could determine the future of digital assets in America, perhaps for decades to come from a regulatory standpoint. And Coy, you worked closely with SEC Commissioner Peirce, who many will know uh, has been very forward thinking on on regulatory matters as it relates to the crypto industry. You know, what has what was your experience like working for the commissioner? Um, so I, I had a great experience working for the commissioner. Um, I have tremendous amount of respect for her and uh, the intellectual rigor and commitment that she brings to her job. And I think one of the beautiful things about working in her office and, and with her team is there there's a real commitment to uh, fostering a sense of innovation, both within the agency itself, but but also fostering that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial innovative spirit of, of America, really, and, and leaning into that, that part of the tripartite mission of the agency, right? There's uh, protecting investors, the facilitating capital formation, and, and ensuring fair and efficient orderly markets. And I think sometimes people can focus too much on the concept of investor protection. And, and part of the SEC's job is to facilitate capital formation as well. Um, so I think, you know, working in the crypto space, both for her and, and previously when I was in the division of corporation finance, crypto was kind of the opportunity that I had uh, to be exposed to folks that were really on the cutting edge of things and trying to do new things. And and the beauty of that is it makes regulators really think deeply about first principles, right? Of why do we do things the way we do? Why do we have the rules that we have? Um, and you have to ask those questions because sometimes the rules don't make sense when a new technology emerges. Um, and I think, you know, so it's it was exciting from a uh, personal experience and, and working on it. It was challenging and, and good and really started off my career. I mean, the last, you know, I, I don't know, the last six, eight years of my career have really been focused on trying to bring regulatory clarity, both both while at the agency and now in, in private practice. Um, mm-hmm. But but certainly I, I think I was was and probably am in a minority view of of how the commission should be operating in that way um and and the last last four years in particular have been quite quite difficult in um seeing any progress but but i'm hopeful that uh, regardless of who wins the election the next administration has an opportunity to really really turn things around here yeah we're going to talk a lot about what the approach has been over the last four years under chair gensler and, and, and really importantly, what it could look like if there's material change in approach to digital assets uh, under a, a new um, chair, for example. Before I get that, I didn't realize that you were at the Division of Corporate Finance. Were you there uh, when Bill Hinman gave his when Harry met Gary, when Howie met Gary <laughs> speech uh, in 2018? I was, yeah. Um, and I, I worked for Bill Hinman. He's a um, fantastic, fantastic guy. And I think he thinks really um, deeply about these issues and um, and the like. So it you know it was really really interesting. I mean, I I, I started um, working on the Winklevoss Bitcoin Trust filing. I was I was just the youngest guy um, in in an office that reviewed those filings and kind of got assigned to it that way. And you know, like anything else, it's you you find an area you're interested in and you kind of uh, grow a little bit of expertise and you start getting invited into more and more meetings. So I. I was able to kind of just become one of the the Bitcoin ETF 
folks that you know was always in the room on on decision making on that and so that's that's how i got introduced to bill and um he was doing deep thinking on on um decentralization and what it what it means you know for icos and everything i mean at the time icos were were pretty new and and that was a you know an unexpected i think focus under the clayton um term at at the sec of of having to wrestle with how how do you approach um ICOs and, and in a, you know, with the existing securities laws and the like. Yeah, it was a wild time. I think the speech was delivered by uh, uh, Director Hinman. Is that what we say? Director of Corporate Finance? Director Hinman. Yeah. Uh, in June 2018, I remember this well. This was a very big deal. The thinking was quite advanced from the director. The sort of the TLDR, perhaps, of the speech that I'm recalling was primarily that there are crypto asset securities, but that they can through primarily through decentralization transition away from being securities and thus needing to follow securities regulations. And he suggested very strongly that Ethereum, his view was that Ethereum had had perhaps started as a an unregistered security, but through decentralization was no longer. Um, is that like an accurate representation? Yeah, I think that's that's mostly right. I mean, maybe a little bit of a light gloss is the the digital asset itself is never the security, but it's offered in a securities transaction at a certain point in time, given the promises, the um, the other facts surrounding the token at the time, and that um, over time, as those transactions continue, those promises seem to go away, and the entrepreneurial efforts of others is um, you know not not of one central party over time, and that's that's why how he came to the conclusion that. ETH was no longer a security and the like. And I think that that thinking it holds is kind of the genesis and holds true throughout uh, a number of different, you know, policy approaches in this space. I know like we'll talk about the, the token yeah. safe harbor from Hester and even in Fit 21, this this concept of decentralization and and how that interacts with the reasonable expectation of profits from the efforts of others under the Howey test. Um, I think it it continues to be form the basis of of not everybody's thinking, but but uh, quite a few yeah. folks thinking. Yeah, I think it was very forward thinking, and you're right. It absolutely, I would say is sort of to the extent there is one, it is the standard. I think, and by the way, it also sets up, I think, very positive incentives for the issuers and projects in general. Right? I mean, they're not in a position to um, dominate the efforts and be that third party if there is no definable third party if it's if the third party is so diffuse that it's effectively any open source developer or a giant sort of diffuse global community of uh developers and stakeholders you know in the case of say like a bitcoin or, or an ethereum today then it it would fail the howey test i think very logically and and most i think who look at this question still agree with that but it also is really good for the incentives right because it encourages decentralization and i think that's um well, it, I think it aligns with the goals of the crypto project more broadly, right? So I always like that. Um, you mentioned something interesting that he, one of the the glosses that you added was that um, the tokens themselves aren't securities, but the, you know, the schema in which they're offered very well could be. This is actually a recent, like, sort of development in the crypto litigation case law where the SEC it almost seems like they admitted they were sloppy basically in their literal litigation pros. Um, they had said crypto asset securities a whole bunch of times across all these cases. But then in one of the cases they amended and started saying like crypto assets offered as securities and had a footnote where they basically apologized to the court for being um, vague or inaccurate because they're now basically adopting what you what Hinman said in the speech and what you just said to the audience that well technically the tokens themselves are just tokens they could be anything they don't necessarily be securities it seems like they took a long time to get to that realization this was only i think a month or two ago that it was going around among the crypto lawyers this strange footnote and amendment in one of these cases i forget which case so i don't want to be too specific yeah I, yeah i mean this is one of those things that's really frustrating for both lawyers and and non-lawyers in the space, because I mean, I think it, I guess my answer is or response is a little bit of yes and no, right? I think the SEC, on one hand, has has really always said that the digital asset is not a security in of itself. In in terms of, you can go back, you know, even to the Dow report, you can find that you can find that in the representations to courts and and actions like um, Kick and Telegram and stuff. I mean, even you know, I'm thinking of I think both cases, certainly the Telegram case. 
the court is quite clear in the conclusion that the digital asset itself is not the security. Um, mm-hmm. But saying that and then actually is, is, is quite different than like inferring that, right? Or just treating them, you know, you can give lip service to that, which I think essentially is, you know, my critique of the SEC is they've, they've essentially given lip service to that. They've, they've said that as a legal matter, but then brought a number of allegations and charges that really suggest that these tokens kind of continue to be sold as investment contracts in perpetuity so long as um, certain marketing efforts, for example, are being made by a, a development team uh, or a central party, right? They'll, they'll glom onto that. And we've seen that in, in all their actions against the, the big exchanges where they've, they've made that allegation. Um, I, I think that's, to me, the inconsistency and the like, and, and you're right, the, um, I can't remember if it was the Binance or the the Kraken court. I think it was the Binance court, um, uh, or maybe it was Kraken now, but getting confused, that that really kind of held them to task of, you're saying one thing, you're saying that it's digital asset is not a security, but then you're using this term crypto asset securities. That's very confusing, right? And and the court's obviously right. It it is confusing. So they, (laughs) they, they clean it up for or agreed to be more straightforward in that case moving forward. But then, you know, on the same day announced a couple settled actions and, and new charges against new defendants where they continue to use the term crypto asset securities. So right. um, we're just, you know, for as long as Gary Gensler is in charge, we're just going to have to deal with that term. Yeah. Cause it, it, it almost seems like there's just not a coherent, like central plan here. It's sort of like, Maybe out of, you know, specific enforcement lawyers or under the head of enforcement who who just left Grewal, like maybe they were running with it. And but like it, it's it, it, I think that the confusion even about the term, I, I, we're pro- I might be making a little too much about this. It is just a term, but it, you know, it has big potential legal, um, um, I don't want to say ramifications, but, you know, mean, <laughs> terms matter in the law. I mean, the law is literally written word. And it almost suggests to me a, like a dysfunction and lack of critical thinking about these deep these issues deeply, right? Like it doesn't feel like a, a you know Hinman thinking deeply about decentralization would have arrived at this like oops we totally mislabeled the main thing that we're suing you over. Yeah, no, it's totally fair. I mean, I guess a couple reactions, you know, just make sure everyone's on the same page, like. The term crypto asset security is not a legal term, right? right? The, the SEC has jurisdiction over transactions in securities and, and sales of securities themselves, classes of securities, registrations and the like. Um, the term security is defined in the securities laws with like, there's like 30 plus terms, right? Like stock, bond, all that stuff, you know, what you typically think of. And the really the only one that in general, when we're talking about crypto assets, it could fit under is this term investment contract. And so to, you know, to use the term crypto asset security to refer to an investment contract, which by its definition refers to transactions uh, and schemes is, is a, you know, is what we're driving at here is, is kind of inconsistent of it's, it's a transaction by transaction analysis when you're dealing with investment contracts. So, mm-hmm. so trying to assign that to a specific asset indefinitely is very problematic and it, it is emblematic of the larger problem that you're pointing out that there doesn't seem to be deep thinking here of what is the goal of all of this. Um, you know, all of these enforcement actions against large crypto trading platforms, you know, usually like what is the end goal here? Because there's no pathway to registration. So it, it seems like both through enforcement actions and in the rulemakings that we've seen that t- have touched on crypto, um, there's a desire you know, to create rules of the road for crypto that cannot be complied with and therefore almost a de facto ban of crypto. And I think that's that to me is the most problematic part of the Getzler um, term with respect to crypto. Yeah, let's talk. Well, we're going to talk more about um, what the future could look like. Let's talk a little bit about your past working for Commissioner Purst and the token safe harbor uh, that she proposed. Um, this is a sort of an entirely different way of thinking about particularly asset registration, disclosure, and issuance. Um, maybe just before we get into, by the way, I encourage people to read this. I think there's two versions of it now. There's an updated version that's quite good. This is among, this is probably the f- formative texts of Commissioner Hester Peirce's digital asset inquiry and line of thinking. Encourage our, our listeners to read those. But maybe you can give us sort of a high-level overview of what the safe harbor is. Yeah, sure. So, 
you know, Commissioner Person really had a vision um, when she, she hired me to help her write these uh, this token safe harbor proposal back in 2019. Um, and I jumped at the opportunity because I think it it's in a good example of the kind of forward thinking uh, that is needed at the agency, right? Of we have this problem, you know, she was looking around, seeing ICOs left and right, raising a lot of money, um, and really no no clear structure or regulatory apparatus to deal with this, right? It's um, it's unrealistic to think that um, some of these that that projects are going to file a S one registration statement, spend millions of dollars in compliance costs um, and the like, and do registered offerings with audited financial statements and, and everything like that. So the thinking was, what if we came up with a exemption from registration uh, that would accomplish a couple goals? One, allow people to experiment with this new technology, experiment with um, distributing tokens and, and building a network, um, but then also protecting the people that are buying the tokens uh, for any reason, if they're buying um, to, to engage in the network, to participate, if they're, you know, even if they're engaging to for speculation purposes or investment purposes. Um, and so the idea was, why don't, why don't we come up with a common set of disclosures um, that an issuer that a token project um, could put out there, right? And, and at the outset, both of, we are selling this this token, and we're going to do the following things, um, and then on an ongoing basis, does it does it make sense to have disclosures and, and for how long and the like, right? And so, um, the the tail end of the safe harbor proposal really tried to come up with a, a way for folks to um, to kind of exit this this new this exemptive reporting process. Um, and essentially borrowing off of the, the theme of decentralization that we started talking about here, right? Mm -hmm. Of is there is there a point in time that this no longer makes sense for disclosures to be coming from a single project team about this, that we're no longer worried about the securities laws to protect information asymmetries uh, for token purchasers. And so the, the token safe harbor idea was, was really cool. And, you know, I think a lot of the problems we've seen in the industry um, – could have been uh, sidestepped really if, if the agency had been more forward thinking and and decided to take up this proposal or or wrestle with it or, or deal with something similar. Um, you know, for what it's worth, I think you know the token safe harbor is, is fantastic, and I think it continues to be a good model to to think about. Um, but it also is somewhat limited, and it, it only deals with the initial issuance of tokens, right? And I think I think we've moved on now. Um, with many more years of experience to see there's there's other areas where the securities laws and crypto intersect where there's a huge lack of clarity and that the SEC could could really be more aggressive in in thinking about solutions to the problem uh, as opposed to just ways of trying to to stuff out the technology. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think the the proposal and, and you're definitely right about it not covering things like for example exchange really of the no. assets themselves but um, it does show to me a very thoughtful realization and recognition that most of these crypto networks um, and the assets that may be involved with them or power them if they're a decentralized network or want to be um, don't look like a common equity. Right. And, and literal little things like an S1 registration form didn't have the, the correct questions like for for these types of networks right like i mean even at its base what i've heard and thought myself when looking at this is that like it's not clear how uh like an ethereum would have filled out an s1 like it's not sure right it has to something had to be sort of thought recognized that there was something a little at least a little different and and this was one of those you know approaches that recognized that right that these aren't common equity securities of course, yeah, and, and you know, and it's par for the course for the SEC to consider exemptions and different approaches for for either different types of securities or assets being issued. Um, uh, I guess I should say securities being issued, um, and and scaled disclosures and and the like, right? I mean, you you have Regulation A, you have Regulation Crowdfunding, you have um, exempt offerings under Reg D, for example, uh, that, you know, there's no disclosure requirements and the like for accredited investors. And so it's not unusual for the SEC to tailor its regulations um, for different contexts. Um, but thus far, you know, apps, you take away uh, Hester Purse and, and the SEC really hasn't 
shown any willingness to um, to tailor its regulations in a way that makes sense. Yeah, there hasn't been. Um, Mark Uyeda and his team have been very good too, but they but Hester's uh, work has been sort of the intellectual foundation of alternative ideas on this topic, right? There hasn't. I don't know why they that. Gensler or the commission as a whole can't, uh, you know, convene all the people together and come up with a bunch of it. I mean, instead, it's been happening in Congress. So let, let's talk about some of those proposals, which do go further than the safe harbor. I think Fit 21 is sort of the most, but certainly the most robust that has passed a chamber. And, and of course, it passed the House back in May with a pretty sizable bipartisan contingent, right? I think um, 70 Democrats voted for it, 70 yeah. or 71 Democrats in the in the House. Hasn't been uh, introduced or taken up in the Senate yet, but um, I think there's definitely there will be interest, by the way, I think regardless of really Senate outcome or presidential election outcome, I I think you'll see you'll see a version of it introduced probably over the next year. Um, So anyway, that it does have some disclosure requirements. It has some I think one of my favorite things in Fit 21 that it tries to do whether or not these are the right thresholds, it establishes some some actual thresholds for what is decentralized and what is not, which you know, is a tough game. I mean, I think crypto researchers will tell you that actually quantifying decentralization is pl- plenty subjective. Like there's, it's not, it's not, it's not like a binary, right? Like some people will say it's a spectrum. To me, I don't really think of it as a spectrum, but it's more like the, was it the Supreme Court's famous pornography standard? Like I know it when I see it, it's sort of, I think it is binary, but it's not clear to me, I think, or anyone else, like where the binary line is drawn. But it does try to do that on, on issuance and it has some disclosure stuff, but it also has a lot on market structure. Um, so let me envision a world for you and get you to sort of paint a picture for us. If we had a world in which, say, broker dealers or national securities exchanges could handle, I was going to say digital assets, but let's say that, you know, a lot of them are securities and some aren't. But let's say that, you know, which is kind of probably what would happen under Fit 21. It, it, Maybe some start as them and then later are not. It would be maybe a safe harbor or for 21. What, how does that world change? Because I've seen allegations in some of these litigations that SEC enforcement has brought that they have said, go get a broker dealer. And then the entities, the you know, the, <laughs> the defendants in these civil cases have gotten a broker dealer and then not been able to use it. Like, t- talk me through a little bit what like the upside scenario is for changes in market structure, if a different approach or or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, I thank you for correcting me. Um, I was remiss in not mentioning Commissioner Ueda. He, he has been quite forward thinking on these these issues. So I think that's been a welcome change recently at, at the agency as well. He's he's um, been very vocal of dissenting and, you know, actions against NFTs and, and quite vocal about why the Form S1 registration statement makes makes no sense in this space. Um, with respect to market structure, you know, one of the the good things about Fit 21 is it it really takes it on and says, "Hey SEC, go amend Reg ATS for all Reg ATS is for alternative trading systems. It's it's an exemption for exchanges. So if you meet the definition of exchange, you either need to register as an exchange or you need to register as an uh, ATS under an exemption. Um, the problem under the current rules is there's there's really no way for in ATS, which you have to register as a broker dealer with uh, with the SEC and, and FINRA, to to engage with digital assets that are not securities um, under the securities laws, right? So it's it's kind of this this weird position where you have registered entities that would like to engage in, with digital assets, and you have entities that would like to register that are engaging with digital assets, but the SEC's rulebook does not allow that to happen, right? And so. One of the nice things about Fit 21 is because when you're dealing with market structure, I mean, this stuff is incredibly complex, right? There's even within, like, I'm a securities lawyer, um, within the world of securities law, there is a subset of people that deal with, like, equity market structure issues, right? Um, and it's it's just, it's a complicated thing. So I think one of the smart things about that legislation was it provided some broad guide posts to the agency, but it says, agency, write the rules to allow this to happen. Right. And so that legislation would then kick it to the experts at the SEC to flex their expertise and their knowledge to allow for what are the specific details that need to change to be able to allow this to happen. Right. Um, And I think it's going to require kind of a wholesale new approach to to how 
people think about, you know, again, we, we talked about a little bit at the top, but I think the folks at the SEC need to think through, is there a different way to achieve the same regulatory outcome, right? If, if we care about protecting customers' assets, customers' funds, customers' crypto assets, that's what we care about. How can we do that by tweaking our rules? Like the, the existing rule can't be the only way to get to the desired outcome. And once you set that as the table for SEC staff, they are more than capable and smart enough to propose rules, to get public input on it, to adapt to it and adopt a final rule to allow that to happen. Um, and you just you haven't seen SEC staff be empowered in that way um, to date. Yeah. Do you think if they were empowered and I think here's a question our audience is keen to know. Uh, I mean, I know there's no answer, but there's some p- opinions. Yours is a highly educated one. Let's say for whatever reason, whether it's either presidential candidate takes power, let's say there is a concerted um, decree uh, by the, I guess it would be the White House to, yeah, or, or or the chair, whoever, the current chair could change their mind, whatever, to, to, to do a material pivot and adopt like some of this approach, either engage in comprehensive rulemaking on market structure and issuance. Um, let's say in a, in a, you know, I'll just be put brass tacks to it, right? Uh, former president Donald Trump said in Nashville, he would fire Gary Gensler. Mm-hmm. I think our view and most lawyers views is that he probably doesn't have the authority to fire an independent commissioner, but he could probably appoint an acting chair and immediately sort of change control over the sec. If that were to happen, like how, how fast, like could a pivot even occur in the, sort of the most bullish scenario, whomever that is, if, if, Vice President Harris wins and she makes the same determination. Like, like what structural impediments are there? How fast could it actually happen? Yeah. Um, so folks will be disappointed. There nothing happens quickly at an administrative agency, right? And and um even with the change in administration, uh, you know, even if Gary Gensler follows, you know, precedent and and steps down um, and and allows for a new person to be appointed and, you know, a new leadership comes on board. And let's just assume that process is all taken care of by April of next year. And and it's as quick as possible. You know, changing the SEC's approach to this is going to take the entire four years of the next administration um, and and the like. Right. I mean, like rulemaking takes years. It, it doesn't take weeks. It takes, you know, years, not, not, it's not something that's done overnight. Um, and I think it's, it's something that people maybe in this industry are, well, they're obviously and understandably frustrated by because we're, we're used to things happening uh, super quickly and, you know, and look how much things have changed since when we were talking about the token safe harbor back in 2019 to today. So you can see there's a little bit of a mismatch with the technology that evolves and changes every single day and a regulatory agency that takes years to, to change its approach and, and its rule book and the like. Um, but I don't think that's, that can't be an excuse for sitting around and doing nothing. Right. I mean, I think in my mind, uh, whoever wins the election, the next administration really needs to focus on, restoring the SEC to a position of trust and respect. And I think with with crypto, you do that a couple, you know, you could do that a couple different ways. I think you, you got to stop the bleeding, first of all, on Chair Gensler's kind of offensive approach to crypto, right? So that that includes uh, at, at a minimum pausing, likely withdrawing the enforcement actions against the um, any number of intermediaries, ending the seemingly endless investigations into uh, intermediaries in the space. But it also means uh, taking a look at rules that went through, like the, the change to the definition of dealer, the uh, proposed change to the definition of exchange, the proposed change to uh, safeguarding and custody. Um, you know, really um, things like that, SAB 121 is a, is a low hanging fruit, stuff like that needs to be a- attacked. But then the second step is, okay, if we are changing direction here, and fixing the SEC's approach, how do we want to do this? And, and how do we get meaningful, long-lasting change? Because you can take one tack, which would be, let's move as quickly as possible, and let's just direct the staff to issue no action relief to folks so that, you know, so that folks can have crypto trading platforms, so that uh, tokens can be issued, so that wallet providers uh, can rest assured that they're not a broker-dealer, so that front ends for DeFi platforms can rest assured that they're not an exchange. You know, you could just issue some no action positions and and the like, and and those no action positions would only be good 
for as long as that administration is in power, right? And so I think what makes way more sense, and especially when you're dealing with such substantive issues that deal with serious interpretations of the securities laws, is you really do want a notice and comment process under the Administrative Procedure Act. And, you know, those issues I've just kind of rattled off there off the top of my head, you know, those are just a few of the issues. I'm sure folks yeah. listening to this probably are saying, oh, he should have mentioned X, Y, or Z, right? So I think there really will need to be a concerted um, effort at, at the outset of what are the, you know, let's pick five issues in the crypto space. Because by the way, the SEC deals with a lot of stuff that's non-crypto related that the next chair is going to care about. And how do we prioritize changing that um, through rulemakings? How do we prioritize that? And that's that's something they're they're really going to have to think about. And there's there's no one right path on that. Yeah. So some delays in getting personnel squared away in in the upside scenario, but you think that some relief from current approach can come relatively quickly, but that doesn't actually do the long term durable uh, fix, which is actually the proactive rulemaking. Do you think they work with Congress? They do. You, do you think the SEC needs new uh, authorities? I mean, Chair Gensler's. It's kind of interesting. Chair Gensler has argued they don't need any new authorities, really. I mean, in the past, I think he actually said they did need new authorities, but now he says they don't, um, that you can just force fit all of the crypto issuers, tokens, and intermediaries into existing rules. Um, can, can you with better guidance and rulemaking, or do you think there is a need for new statutory authorization? So I guess two thoughts on that. One, without a doubt, no matter what, there needs to be coordination uh, between the agency and, and Congress, um, you, you mentioned, you know, your your thought that market structure will likely be picked up next Congress, no matter what. And I, I agree with that. You know, you can't if you're the SEC. Why would you waste your time issuing a new rule about secondary trading of cryptos, uh, crypto assets, if Congress is passing a market structure bill that's going to tell you to <laughs> implement new, different regulations or divide your responsibility up with the CFTC, right? right. So I think, without a doubt, you need coordination on that. Um, with respect to new authorities, short answer is yes. I mean, I think if the SEC wants, if you buy into Chair Gensler's vision, which I certainly don't, that the SEC is the regulator of crypto and uh, should be overseeing all of this activity, then I do think you need clear statutory authority to do that. Um, you know, it raises an interesting issue for the industry. If you get, you know, let's, as a hypothetical, let's say if Trump wins, uh, the election appoints a very friendly uh, crypto to to the crypto industry um, chair of the agency, and they're willing to you know move forward with helpful guidance that that allows people to have regulatory certainty. You know, then the industry is faced with a, a question, right? Do we do we try to support uh, getting quick regulatory certainty that's based on you know questionable statutory authority? Or do we do we opt for the the longer game and and really try to push for Congress to give clear um, express direction in this space? And I think that's that's something that's going to have to play out. We're just going to see how people deal with that, and 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 it's going to depend on the issue too, right? Yeah, I think even you know rulemaking from a federal agency um, can be rolled back. It's it's not as easy, unfortunately, by the way, for when bad rules are made, it's actually, you got to unwind them. It's not literally that easy, but certainly it's easier to roll back than, than statutes, right? And so I totally agree that the legislation is a long, longer game versus the immediate relief. It does feel like um, there would be some immediate relief, though, on some of these issues. And then then, then you're, yeah, then you've got to really engage. Th these are complicated issues. W what would happen, let me put this to you, Coy. I was thinking about whether it's Fit21 or Token Safe Harbor. Let's say you start as a crypto asset security and it, it's somehow possible, you know, like either it's the safe through the safe harbor or like um, market structure, either through guidance or legislation changes. And so now like a normal broker dealer can offer it to tons of people, like, you know, like any equity security, basically. Um, but over time you become, so now you're traded, let's just say it like fidelity.com, which is a broker dealer, a big one, right? Uh, it's actually fidelity brokerage services, but you know, I know cause I worked there, but like you're traded like a security, right? And you have disclosures and, and stuff you got to do cause you, you are a security under the new rules or under the safe harbor, whatever. But then over time you transition to a commodity, like broker dealers, can they 
they they can't trade commodities, can they? Like, how does that like what happens then? Like, if everybody's trading it happily on the New York Stock Exchange, which trades equity securities, like, does yeah. it have to move to like the NYMEX because it's now a commodity? Like, do you yeah. think we'll get that level of clarity? Like, in a, or do we and do we need to? And and again, in this situation where this is all sort of sorted out. Yeah. No. I mean, well, I think you do need that level of clarity um, because look, the the technology is not going away, right? And you know. Um, Folks want to be able to trade what I'll I'll just refer to as traditional securities, and they want to be able to trade crypto assets, regardless of what those crypto assets are, you know, categorized under under the law. So I think over time it's inevitable that these these two sides will will come together, um, and it really demonstrates the importance of why you need to unleash. The ability of the SEC to be more innovative in its approach, right? You need need to allow for testing of how do we allow broker dealers to engage with digital assets that are not securities? What what safeguards do you put on that, right? Do you do you limit the amount of non security digital assets that can be used? Does it have to be in a, a wholly separate subsidiary that that has limits on its activities? What should those limits be? Um, you know, room for experimentation and regulation here makes a lot of sense. Uh, regulatory humility and recognizing that maybe the first calibration is not going to be exactly right. So, you know, maybe it's a time limited exercise and you learn lessons from it and adapting that, you know, these are the types of changes that quite frankly, like this is not how the SEC operates, but it's how the SEC could operate. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think you need, you need leadership that is going to push for uh, experimentation and, and changes like that. Yeah, I, we've seen some of that out of the UK with the FCA, certainly in the Emirates and in, in the Middle East. Um, Europe took a little bit of a different approach, which was like, let's just pass a whole new giant pile of, of rules specific for crypto, which I think can also work. Um, but it does seem if we don't want to overhaul the entire securities law architecture, we need some clarifying legislation and rules. Are, you're, you're optimistic that America, regardless of how like the political outcomes and whatever, you think America is going to solve this core, or do you think we're going to fumble the bag here? <laughs> no, I'm I'm forever an optimist, and and I have tremendous faith in this this country and the entrepreneurial sphere that really serves as the backbone of it. So I I think I think we will get there, and you know even within such a divided political atmosphere that we have, you know you mentioned 71 House Dems voted for uh, Fit 21. Um, the SAB 121 Congressional Review Act repeal, I think, oh boy, I'm going to mess up the number, 13 Senate Dems, something like that. Um, there is bipartisan support for providing regulatory guidance here um, in different different realms. So I think, unfortunately, you know, the, the leadership of Chair Gensler on this issue has been unfortunate, to say the least. Um, but I think with different personnel uh, under a new administration, there's there's strong strong opportunities. There's plenty, plenty of room for opportunities uh, to, to try to get it right. Well, thank you so much for painting that picture for us of what it could look like. Um, and ending on that optimistic note, um, Coy Garrison, partner at Steptoe, former counsel to SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, former senior counsel at the Division of Corporate Finance, Corporation Finance, under Bill Hinman, uh, a legend that speech in, in crypto law and policy. Coy, thank you so much for coming on Galaxy Brains. Thanks for having me. That's it for this week's episode of Galaxy Brains. Thanks to our guest, Coy Garrison, partner at Steptoe, and Bimnet BB from Galaxy Trading, as always. Everyone have a safe and happy weekend, and we will catch you next week. Thanks for listening to Galaxy Brains, the weekly podcast from Galaxy Research. If you enjoy the show, please like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. To follow Galaxy Research, sign up for our weekly newsletter at gdr.email, read our content at galaxy.com research, and follow us on Twitter at glxyresearch. See you next week.